Good afternoon, beloved community. Um, my guest for the next hour is going to be Luli Mola, who is the Vice President of um, Community Impact for the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. But before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and why we're doing this Instagram live show and what's going to be happening in the next uh, couple of hours. So my name is Paku Hang, and I am the Chief Program Officer for Vote Run Lead. I'm speaking to you live from Minneapolis, which in the Dakota language means city of water. In a city where just seven days ago, George Floyd was murdered um, at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. Um, why are we doing these calls? You know, Vote Run Lead is a nonprofit that is dedicated to lifting up women, to training women to run for public office and to win. And we do this work because we believe deeply that women's lived experiences offer a different type of leadership. Women's leadership manifests in being more civil to each other, being more collaborative, and being more constituency serviced, focused on what the community needs are. But Vote Run Lead is not just supporting any women. We are actively supporting women who are um, feminist, who are intersectional, and who are anti-racist. Um, and so we are building and trying to build a new democracy and a new world where everyone can be seen and valued, something that George Floyd was not seen, nor was he valued. Um, so what's going to be happening for the next hour is that I'm going to, um, myself and my colleague, Aaron Villardi, we're going to be interviewing community activists and elected officials on the hour until 5.30 to get the real stories of what's happening in Minneapolis and um, to to understand where community members are coming from and, and what they're experiencing. As I said before, my um, my next guest is going to be Luvi Mola, and I know that she's going to be joining us in a little bit. Um, Luli has been a friend of Vote Run Lead for a very long time, and since these protests have started, she has been um, tweeting and and uh, writing and posting about them on her Facebook stream. And so if you haven't already, I would really encourage you to go and seek her out. Her name is Luli Mola, and I know that we're just waiting for her to join us um, We've been having some type of technical difficulties earlier in the morning, so it's possible that she's just having some problems joining us. I um, And here she is. We're just going to be um, inviting you to be more like her. Hi, Lily. Good afternoon. Hi, Paco. Good to talk to you again. Can you hear me fine? I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to, um, to talk to us again. So just for our audience, this is Luli Mola. She is the Vice President for Community Impact um, of the Women's Foundation for Minnesota. She's also been a longtime activist and a longtime Vote Run Lead advisor. She's someone that I, I love deeply and respect so much. Um, Luli, when this started uh, just a week ago, I know that right away you and a friend of ours, uh, Nevada Little Wolf, you guys went down to the third precinct. The third precinct for all of you um, who are not from Minnesota, third precinct is a police station for South Minneapolis for this area next to or nearby where George Floyd was killed. And um, Luli, you and Nevada went down there. Can you tell us what you first saw and, and what, what, what were people doing then? Yeah, first, um, I just want to thank you, Paku, for all of the love and solidarity and everyone at Vote Run Lead for hosting these conversations today. Um, when, so I, I said this earlier, um, many of us, you know, had a three-day weekend over Memorial Weekend. I personally was feeling good and ready to start um, to set my intentions for the week. Um, and then quickly Monday learned and unfortunately saw the video of the murder of George Floyd at the hands of law enforcement. Um, while the killing happened um, right by the store Cup Foods on Chicago and East 38th, um, the precinct associated was blocks from my home. And so because there was protests happening, I felt like I needed to go and bear witness, mostly because it was so close to me and because it was black and brown youth that were out there. And I knew um, 
no matter what happened, you know, media that are not on the, that is not on the ground or not tell the truth of what is happening. And we needed community uh, uh, members to come out and just stand with the youth. So that was my initial reason for um, going. Yeah. You know, Luli, you, you just said it, and in your Facebook, you, you use this language of bearing witness, right? And I think there was even a post where you said, this is the truth that I've seen with my own eyes. Can you share with me, like, why are you using that language of bearing witness? Why, why, why have, you, have you chosen that intention to use that phrase, and why? Yeah, um, I think there is a quote by Malcolm that's, I can't say it directly, that's something like, if you're not careful, the media will have you believing um, victims are perpetuators and perpetuators are victims or something of that sort. Um, it's really critical that we see what is happening, which is an uprising um, in defense of freedom and justice from a political context, right? So if you're looking at what is happening without adding um, a political lens, without adding an intersectional lens, you, will, you may see rioting, quote unquote. You may see looting. Um, you may see um, pro protesters disrupting the city, right? And you may see George Floyd's name uh, not being protected and honored. Uh, what we have to do as community members that are working at the intersection of racial justice, gender justice, is shape what is happening uh, for the public, both locally and nationally. So when you add uh, this lens, you will see like, instead of rioting, it's an uprising, right? Because people are tired and sick and scared and angry and sad and hurting. What you see as looting could be reframed as people in need in proximity to resources. Um, I said this earlier, when I saw folks take things, and I'm not advocating for taking things that don't belong to you, right? I, I wanna be clear. Yeah. But when I witnessed people in need <laughs> take things from the stores, their piles didn't look any different than the piles that people with means had when we were stocking up for COVID. The difference is one had the means to be prepared and the other didn't, right? So people that were taking things were not just like um, uh, quote unquote, like delinquent youth or thieves, right? Like it wasn't that, it was families. Um, there were children around. Um, it also wasn't only black, indigenous and people of color. It was also a lot of white folks. I saw college students. Um, I saw all types of people. Uh, so, so reframing that helps. And then lastly, what you see as protesters uh, disrupting the city, when you add a racial justice and intersectional lens and a political uh, lens to it, you will understand that there are people standing up for justice and calling for freedom. And then there are white nationalists within um, what the public is deeming as protesters that are there to disrupt. So right. all of the graffiti is not by people seeking justice, right? Some of the graffiti is to make it look like it's by people seeking justice. Um, the burning of particularly black indigenous and people of color businesses and organizations is not happening by black indigenous and people of color. We saw it happening by mostly white people dressed in all black. Every time a building was about to set in flames, we would see these people, these folks run away. And so in the beginning, we don't know, like, we don't know what is what. Um, and so I couldn't sit here and tell you all of this, but as the days developed, it became clear that there is a strategy that is coordinated by um, a group that is opposed to uh, racial justice, um, uh, equality, freedom, you name it. Um, but the public narrative has not caught up to that. So that's really why I felt like we needed to be out there to make sure we're shaping this narrative. All right, so that you're bearing witness. 
Yeah. So, um, Luli, in one of your Facebook posts, I think a more recent one, who talked about how you were a member of a volunteer crew that was doing some patrolling in North Minneapolis. And so just to give folks some context, South Minneapolis is where George Floyd was killed and where the third precinct is. But there's another community called North Minneapolis where we've had predominantly um, African-American um, uh, residents. And Luli, you were there a couple of nights ago doing some patrolling at night. Can you tell us why you were there? What did you see? Yeah, um, communities have been out. So um, after the first couple of nights where businesses were burned down, and we realized that it actually is not the youth that are uprising, that are burning down and, uh, and destroying our neighborhoods. Um, it is a targeted, targeted, coordinated strategy by what we believe are white nationalist groups. Um, community members feel like it is a duty to come out and protect their neighborhood. So you had native people um, at the United Tribe of Little Earth in Minneapolis come out and protect their, their uh, residential area. Folks in North Minneapolis set up an organized way to protect um, that neighborhood. And really people all over have been, have been really courageous and protecting their neighborhoods. So in that vein, a couple of us went to go volunteer over North we were not armed, and what we were prepared to do was look for people um, coming to commit arson. Um, and if that were the case, for us to um, inform one another, inform the local police department, uh, and that is why we were out um, unarmed, right? And really not thinking um, beyond that. And it might have been naive, but that's where we were. So at around 11.30 when we were out, um, we were shot at by uh, what we believe are um, by white men in RVs and uh, pickup trucks. Luckily, those of us that were not armed um, sought safety and went home immediately. And soon after, only um, licensed and armed, uh, mostly black men, went out to protect the residential areas. Um, working in partnership with women that were at the hub, coordinating, communicating, surveillance, etc. Uh, so after that, we real, so here's, here's what I want to offer. One, um, it is very, the, that neighborhood was targeted. Um, that same night, two businesses burned down. Um, and there was no protest there, right? So this, you can't say this, these were rioters because there were, there were no protesters there. This was, the neighborhood was um, peaceful and the only folks out were community like protectors. Yep. Um, the second is this movement has uh, multiple layers. One is um, the uprising of the youth. The second is um, the organized tactical demand for the four officers who are involved with the murder to be charged, convicted. Um, the third is long-term re-envisioning of uh, revisioning of police and security in our communities, uh, starting with divestment, um, called by a group called Black Visions Collective of eight million dollars from the police departments um, from the city's budgets, yeah. and then now, as of a couple of nights ago, it's confirmed that we are now protecting ourselves from white supremacists and nationalists who are targeting and attacking us openly. That along with the president's um, uh, warning of a national military being deployed, be deeply concerned um, and frustrated because it feels like there is a war on protesters. And whenever there's a war on anything, whether it be a war on poverty, a war on drugs, we know that black, indigenous, and people of color are disproportionately criminalized and we pay for it for years to come, right? So I'm not only thinking about what is happening right now, I'm thinking about what will happen in the weeks to come, in the months to come, in the years to come, about how Black, Indigenous, and people of color, how we are safe here, how we are protected here, how we are organized here, and then how we are viewed here. Because at the end of the day, this is our home and we'll continue living here. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for what you just said. You know, um, 
I come back to this, the beginning when you said about bearing witness, right? Because I feel like if we don't tell our stories, other people will tell it. And I feel like last night the president was saying how like the presence of the large military presence of the National Guard is what prevented it more violence. And I'm thinking that's not true. Like, just like you with my own eyes, I'm seeing it's community groups that came together. It was some structural stuff like um, like the curfew or like the highways being down that that curtailed activity. It was, but it was people watching out for each other and preventing that violence. That was the reason why it curtailed after that first night. But the narrative, at least from the federal level with the president, it was, it was a military presence and that's not true. And so I just really want to, I want to affirm what you're saying, um, Lobi, because we we are protecting our own community. That's that's how we safeguarded, you know, um, escalation of violence. Yeah, and we're and we're calling for protection of the protectors. You know, folks are out protecting their communities. If some of them are armed, um, they can be wor They should not be worried about being targeted by police. And I want to say, if these are um, black, indigenous, and people of color with any records, um, who, or if they are not, if they may not be licensed, they can be criminalized. But no one else, like, not, last night it was peaceful because folks were more prepared, a lot more people came out, the message was um, uh, spread internally, right? So last night, I do not know of any shots at protectors, I do not know of any burnings of, um, uh, of buildings, but the night before, we like we didn't know who was who. Yeah, I I heard from little um, community protectors that they were concerned that they were like they were shot rubber bullets and tear gas by the police um, as they were trying to protect their hub from white supremacists. Um, over in North Minneapolis, as black men are out. Um, particularly two nights ago, yesterday it was both men and women. Um, we, there was no guarantee that the police couldn't come and, and hold them responsible, right? So like who is protecting the protectors is also a question that is, that is coming up, especially when no one else is, is protecting these communities. Yeah. Um, Ruby, I know that you, you're very busy, so I want to thank you so much for your time, but I wonder if I can ask you one more question. Um, you work with youth, and you've worked with youth for a long time, and in this moment, we said that you're very witness, especially for our black and brown youth. What do you say to them who are seeing everything that's happening and are being weighed down by despair? What, what, what do you say to our young people? Is there, is there hope? Yeah, I think we say, um, we, we collectively say we love you, we see you, we hear you. Um, uh, Leslie Redmond, the president of the NAACP, framed it as the following. Uh, youth have been watching um, the, the murder of people that look like them since they, since they begun like being con conscious. You know what I mean? Like for some of us is in the last five, six years, but they've like, it's almost normalized. So what does it do to their psyche? Yeah. And um, how does it impact the way they see themselves, the way they see the world and the way they see their safety? So for sure, like we love you, we protect you, we honor you, um, we understand you, you are included. Um, we understand you will inherit this community. You are protecting this community. You have a right to protest. You have a right to ask for justice. Um, we also uh, want youth to be safe, right? So I am all for being organized and making sure our safety and security is also protected, just like our voice and right to protest. So now it's more like, yes, we should gather. Yes, we should demand for justice. And, and we should plan wisely to be safe um, and to be secure. Um, I also just want to uplift like youth that are living at the intersection of so many things because yeah. now we're at the intersection of like a pandemic yeah. and an uprising, right? A pandemic and being targeted by white supremacists. Um, some youth may be homeless. Uh, so a lot of the girls um, that are uh, on the front are also dealing with other issues of what it means to be young, black, young indigenous and women um, or 
you, you know, don't have economic stability. A lot of the businesses that were burnt down are going to impact the youth that live around there. Yeah. So just understanding that this is a multi-issue movement and we must have multi-strategies to, to respond is yeah. also um, something that I would offer. Words of wisdom, sister. Um, I see you, I love you, I honor you. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing, Luby. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to talk to us. Thank you, Kaku, and thank you everyone at VRL. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So beloved community, there you have it. Um, wise words from our sister Luby Mola in Minneapolis, the city of many waters. Um, this is for us done for right now, but please join us again at the next hour at one o'clock Central Standard Time where we'll be talking to more community activists and civic leaders about what are the real stories that are happening on the ground in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Thank you for joining us.